As the topic says, I mean, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about how we use Radis at the Home Depot. And I've got some members, my, my colleagues from Home Depot, so they can jump in. Also, the other thing is if you have any questions, anything at all, just jump in any stage. We can make it interactive and hopefully short. So uh, I, I think kind of like going into it, uh, Home Depot, I don't think needs much of an introduction. I'm sure hopefully all of you shop there and off, but just to give you a little bit of background, yeah, I mean, it's pretty big, scale's a big deal. That's really the bottom line, right? I mean, everything that we do is pretty big. I think on track to be about 100 billion this year, so uh, the, uh, I mean, the scale and the, the volume at which we operate really demands that, you know, everything that we do, we need to look at it from a, how does it really scale standpoint? So. I think there's enough information about it uh, online, so I won't spend too much time on that. But focusing on the actual problem that we had to solve. So we come from uh, the sort of like the team within Home Depot that's focused on enabling uh, omni-channel auto fulfillment. So when we talk about omni-channel auto fulfillment, it's effectively, I mean, hopefully most of you who shop with Home Depot have been to like, say, homedepot.com and you've done a pickup in store, you've done a you know, return of merchandise that you've picked up in store, uh, delivered merchandise, so on and so forth. So we pretty much are the team that enables most of that. Uh, from a scale standpoint, I mean, just that particular segment of what we call the non-carry demand, anything that's not coming out of the point of sale, is about $28 billion. I mean, that's, that's effectively what our platform tries to uh, fulfill. And uh, in the scope of doing that, we do close to like 30,000 uh, inventory-related transactions per second. Uh, from an overall database standpoint, again, we'll go into that in a little bit more detail. We've got a polyglot persistent strate strategy, but we do close to like 50,000 operations per second, I mean, on a regular day. Uh, also fulfill about 250,000 order lines per peak I mean, That's roughly the scale at which things op operate. Again, if you have any questions, please jump in any stage. Uh, going into the context, uh, that's the order management platform, obviously, for, you know, most retailers, especially of our scale, uh, there is a historical you know, set of legacy applications that, that we had to carry. One in particular was SOA compliant, but you know, Java-based, absolutely, but uh, was a monolith. So sometimes you know, with monoliths, I mean, it's not like the application was bad by any means, but during the course of last year, when we actually completed that omni-channel fulfillment initiative, what we were trying to do is roll out the application for the online channel and for the 1,982 stores. Is that? Yeah, I think. So 1,982 stores you know, at the Home Depot. Uh, that turned out to be uh, more adventurous than we would have liked. I mean, it clearly wasn't going very well. So. Uh, we were at about 400 stores beginning of last year, and you know we had to get to the remaining stores. And a lot of these stores, there are like lots of applications that interact with our platform, but ones that we couldn't really control because there were like, like you know, lots and lots of applications that had, that had already been deployed at the store that just had a lot of bad practices. You know, like simple things like if you try to say, look up an order and it's not there, and there's an exception that says it's not there, they wouldn't give up, right? I mean, they would come back and ask that 1,000 more times in a minute just to make sure. So that sort of thing. And that, that sort of makes for some really interesting challenges. So the point was some aspects of it were like monolithic, but kind of like nice and pretty. I mean, they, they did work well. But some other aspects of it, we're monolithic and not so well. And so the risk was like incredible. So every time we wanted to do a fix, like we weren't really sure what was going to come out on the other end. So uh, we got to a two-week release cycle, eventually not exactly where we want to be, but even that was a challenge. So just, just, just where things were. Uh, in terms of where we want to go to, I mean, just to quickly cover that before we go into the details of you know, how we use Redis in that specific context. So we're going through an architectural transformation where we're trying to take these monolithic applications. I won't repeat it. I, I'm probably tired of hearing it myself. So you all know the microservice stuff, and that's where we want to go. But I can assure you, and I saw this in the session earlier today, you know, this nice box, I think the first session in the morning where 
There was like one box that said order and microservice. I wish it was that easy, but it's not. I mean, any, anyone who worked on any, any of this stuff know that anyone who thinks that customer is a microservice or order is a microservice, I, I, I think it's just not living in reality. I, I mean, hopefully that resonates with most of you. But, but you know, I found that really funny because you, you, you take like a $28 billion order management system and say that's a microservice, I mean, that's kind of funny. But that apart, I think from a transformation standpoint, we're continuously looking at, hey, how can we take this large monolith, break it up into multiple smaller pieces as appropriate, and also get to a polyglot persistent strategy? Because one of the things that we learned, we had Oracle as the backend, nothing against Oracle, but we did have scalability concerns, especially when we had clients that were not as disciplined as we would like. And in some cases, some of those clients were systems that we wrote, just bad code that we ourselves wrote. In some cases, it was code that someone else wrote that we didn't really control. But in both cases, the point is uh, the amount of load that was actually being thrown on the system, I mean, again, to the tune of about 50,000 operations per second, trying to do that only on Oracle, with a three-node rack, with most of it being on solid-state drives. I mean, so this was like state-of-the-art infrastructure from a hardware standpoint. Just doesn't scale. Because the point is, end of the day, if the application has behaviors where there's a high amount of concurrency, and anyone who's worked on like Oracle DB2, I mean, no, I mean, I think I think you probably realize what I'm talking about. If there's a high amount of concurrency, high amount of CPU weights, high amount of application weights because of the size of the transaction that you're doing, I don't know how many of you have lived through like blocking lock hell and deadlocks, and I mean, any of you who lived through that, I mean, my my sympathies are with you, but. <laughs> It's, it's just not fun. I mean, not, not in a production context for sure. So that, that's exactly what we were going through. And in the process of actually scaling, I mean, some of these weaknesses were showing up you know, even more. So we went through this polyglot strategy where we took what was in the relational database. So today, I mean, the, the journey is not done by any means, but I think we're in definitely a better place today than we were like last year. So we had about like the 50,000 IOPS that were there. You know, per second, we've managed to offload about 30,000 of those IOPS into other NoSQL databases so far. So that's kind of like where we've gotten to. Out of the 30,000, roughly 10,000 of the operations come out of Redis. I mean, that's just on a regular hour. I mean, it can vary a little bit, but about 10,000. It's so about one-fifth of our overall load. You know, we were able to move that into Redis. And in terms of some of the other key pieces of that polyglot persistent strategy, I mean, I'm sure all of us need there is still a place for a SQL database like Oracle because when you deal with something like auto management, you need the asset transactions. So it's not like it comes. So our relational database continues to be Oracle, the distributed NoSQL of choice is Cassandra. So we have a, you know, a fairly, I would say, it's not a very large, but about a 10 node Cassandra ring in two data centers. Uh, we use Elasticsearch as our search engine of choice. And for in-memory, we pretty much settled on Redis. So that's kind of our stack in addition Kafka plays a pretty important role. I mean, the moment it comes to messaging. So that's like overall what we went about doing. In the midst of all this, anything new that we were writing, we were writing it on Cloud Foundry, on the past, and obviously that uses Redis, goes without saying. But in most cases, if, if that was a microservice as it was intended to be, then the backend storage needs with Redis, in many cases, weren't that challenging. I mean, at least the scale at which we were trying to solve that was, was okay. And, one of the patterns that we followed, at least with regards to the, uh, the monolithic part of the app where, again, uh, we had a very short time frame. I, for all practical purposes, I would say the application was sick and we had to give just the right amount of Redis to get it out of sickness at some level. And the way we actually did that, uh, we'll go through that in more detail, but in that process, we made the decision that we were not going to enable Redis persistence because in most of these cases, we were just going with, for a given purpose, there was one node of Redis. So again, very, very simple from an ops standpoint. And the failover would always be with the relational database. So it was no worse than where we were. I mean, in most of these cases, the relational database was serving that workload. All we were trying to do is sort of like, if we can get that increased performance benefit by going to Redis, that's, that's great. If it fails, not too much damage done. We just fail over, go to the relational database, and all's well, hopefully, I mean, if the relational database works. Fortunately, however, for the last year and a half that we've implemented this, 
we've just not had a single problem. I mean, that's, I'm not making that up. We've not had one problem with Redis. We, we don't have a very large Redis footprint. In terms of, even though it's 10,000 operations, it's spread across eight dedicated instances right now. Uh, it's it's going to expand quite a bit. But but that eight node, not a cluster, eight separate nodes of Redis for, in most cases, very dedicated purposes for which we use it. I mean, that that's made a very significant difference. So going on, I think in terms of how we go about doing it, again, uh, I think most of you will be familiar with this. For the size of what we're trying to do, we really had to, you know, this really wasn't much of a choice, right? So the way in which you go about breaking the monolith and moving it into those services, we had to use a strangler pattern. We continue to use a strangler pattern. And really, for all practical purposes in an agile world, the only pattern that you can use, because you know, you're not going to go lock yourself in a room for two years and try to build this from scratch. So. I think with that sort of background of where we were, I mean, coming to the uh, the specific challenge, I mean, we had to go by April and I think April of last year, if, if, if I'm not wrong. Uh, yeah, I think April. So, so we had to complete the rollout for the 2,000 stores and for online. It was a very, very dramatic situation that we really wish we were not in, but we were. So that's where kind of like, OK, so how do we use Redis and use it very quickly to make a difference and use it from the SOA-based monolithic app, not from the microservice, which is a bit of a no-brainer. And absolutely, we use it there. But I'm not focusing on that because, I, I'm, like I said, I mean, sometimes, I mean, just reality is you've got to do what you've got to do to make your immediate problem work. And, and that's, that's what our situation was. So in terms of some of the patterns that we were using it for, the first one is sort of like concurrency management. Uh, so overall, I think, it, I want to say it's almost like a bit of, we used to see these denial of service attacks for all practical purposes. We were behind the firewall. So you would think we would not have an issue of that sort, but we did. So I can <laughs> vouch for the fact that we had these multiple clients that you know would just go berserk in terms of coming in hammering the order management system with order updates or order modifications that we just couldn't control. And the relational database was very unforgiving because the moment you have, let's say, you know, 10 chains of blocking locks, any, any of you who like, work with like Oracle or DB2 know that it takes very little for the database to really degrade, right? So the moment you start having those chains form, the database effectively starts uh, sort of degrading in its performance. So every other transaction that's going to the database as well starts degrading. So it's like it takes very little impetus for it to actually start, you know, really spiraling out of control. So that's where we implemented this concurrency management solution. And the concurrency management solution effectively tries to enforce the uh, the contract that we had with the client. So the expectation was that the clients wouldn't go and do crazy things of that sort. So we actually had this dashboard and then with Redis in literally one or two iterations. I mean, that was really the cool part about it. So between the time we conceptualized it to actually take it into production, which was two to three weeks. I mean, that's literally the time it took. We, we, we built this layer and we could start showing client systems to say, hey, we had a contract that said, if you come and take this particular operation and it's not successful, it's supposed to fail. You're not supposed to go, you know, go on a loop and do this denial of service attack type thing, but that's what you're doing. And then we could have a dashboard and take it back to the clients. But the important thing was instead of having a production incident because some aspect of the ecosystem didn't work as we expected it, we were able to you know, pretty much ring fence the impact to that impacted client alone and let the rest of the enterprise, which is close to about I want to say around 10 different client systems work seamlessly and not make everyone suffer for you know one person's mistake. Uh, that entire thing took just about a gig of RAM you know to implement, and, and I mean it was quite surprising that that's all it took for us to you know cut down a lot of noise, and that improved the database health tremendously because the application weights on the database went away, the concurrency was in much better shape. So the database was actually performing, the relational database, sorry, was performing much better because we had taken the messy workload that relational databases don't like out into Redis. And Redis was doing it flawlessly, very, very easily, you know, no, no, no real issues. Uh, 
the the other aspect of it is within the application the moment we saw that this pattern was working the large number of jvms that make up the application would all effectively start using redis as a semaphore effectively we would go into redis record whatever is our primary entity let's say it's the customer order or the purchase order or the work order whatever is you know in your context the right entity effectively use that as a semaphore to say hey if there's going to be multiple concurrent transactions that are happening on the semaphore you may want to consider either not doing it right now or we also built a version of it that would actually do a store and process so you could actually come with a request and if the client was okay with sort of like a reactive type of behavior we would register the request when the client actually comes in and makes that particular request record it in the semaphore i mean record it against the semaphore put the content into redis and then do a pub sub type callback handler that would come back and say now the you know the previous semaphore that you were going after has been cleared so why don't you go and process it effectively so so that that turned out to be quite useful as well and and the other aspect there was the whole uh, distributed lock manager like like especially as we were trying to do this in a multi data center hot hot setup some aspects of it that we still rolling out but effectively the distributed lock manager guaranteed that for the entity that we wanted protection functionally we could start providing a notion of locking for example you know you take a customer order in an omni channel world you can basically come through your mobile and try to edit that particular order or you know you can call the call center you can go online you can go in store all of those are valid options so effectively in order to ensure that there is consistency functionally with what you are doing to the order we we effectively use the distributed lock manager implementation to guarantee that we know exactly which user in which system in what context is working on that order at a specific point in time and that way we can prevent others from coming in and then we can actually throw an exception and say can't do it right now again help helped a lot with getting the Uh, the relational database in good shape one of the things that we currently implemented doesn't have to be this way longer term we 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 are, we are hoping to migrate to the redis enterprise uh, solution but we currently on the uh, are on the open source and so we actually built an application level backing persistent storage with cassandra so we every time we would go do these operations we were actually writing it to redis and at the same time writing it to cassandra and using cassandra as the sort of persistent data store and using redis more as an in memory cache purely in memory database purely and then using the application to go make the determination of when to go pull up the records from cassandra and load it into redis so so that's basically what we did doesn't have to be that way we we totally realize redis is capable of handling that but we'll probably do that as we upgrade in terms of some of the other patterns of usage i mean this is the no brainer one it's the read cache i mean uh, i mean i think it's a given all of us know it the point is in the context of like an application software i think someone was talking about salesforce earlier today and if you take scenarios like order management uh, you know like order order capture order fulfillment uh, which is which is sort of the you know use case that we were in uh, building that read cache for a lot of this master data that doesn't you know change that often just makes a ton of sense if you take something like catalog i mean i think most of you know the the you know the item and the item details it just makes a lot of sense to take most of that data loaded into redis even with about 1.6 million items for the subset of data that we really wanted we we didn't need the whole master slave uh, it makes a lot of sense that we would evolve into it but currently we're not there we just used one instance of redis pretty much i think it took about approximately 2 gigs of ram but it was a hash of hash i mean that's the data structure that we used and i think that gave us some sort of like memory compression benefits as well so when we did the hash of hash we did pipelining and then for each one of these master data elements where we wanted that improved cache performance as the data comes in from a one time mass upload standpoint it goes into redis and then on an ongoing basis when the catalog gets maintained it also goes and updates it against the cache again no major damage done if the redis instance is not available because we could always fail over and use the relational database like we always used to but we've never had a reason to do that so so that's actually worked out quite well for us sort of continuing on that pattern of caching 
The other thing that we did was, in many scenarios, we implemented a, a write-through cache, uh, just like there's a the read cache. In some cases, I'm, I won't go into the functional scenario because it may not apply as much to you, but at the point when we were writing to Redis, we would also go and write it I mean, at the point when we were writing it to the relational database or Cassandra, based on the context, we would also write it to Redis. And that way it was there in both places from a sort of like write through standpoint. And other JVMs that were after the same information, I mean, uh, one of those scenarios was, hey, this particular inventory has run out for this item at this location. Let's say that's your scenario. There are multiple JVMs that all need to be aware of that scenario. So the first JVM is actually going and doing this update does right through on both places so that other subsequent JVMs don't need to do any heavy lookups on the database and effectively just get that answer using the right through cache. The other pattern is a right back cache where in scenarios like where we were trying to track, uh, say, the statistics of a particular JVM module, and, and even from a functional standpoint, let's say like leaderboards and things of that sort, what are the items selling through the quickest, uh, you know, aspects of that kind, where it was acceptable for us to lose the data because we had, again, not enabled persistence. We used to do the write back where we just write it into like a hash or a sorted set type data structure, and then uh, have a timer on it, and then use a Redis pub sub type mechanism to go uh, asynchronously then go persist it to disk, and th that, that kind of worked quite well. Uh, also, the log buffering was another example. I mean, I, I, if any of you worked on, like, say, Cloud Foundry, for example, uh, there are sometimes, if, if you look at the sys out stream, uh, you can actually inundate your Cloud Foundry instance with the amount of logs that you generate. So what we did was a custom appender that effectively writes through via a Redis instance. And so the application's not depending on sysout. It's effectively you know, writing to the Redis cache. And then there's a pub sub type mechanism where the subscriber is writing it. That's, that's something we're working on. Uh, CQRS, again, is a, is a broad pattern. I think it was brought up in the discussion earlier today. Uh, it's the command query response separation, if I got that right. Uh, effectively, long story short, we do a lot more of CQRS with Cassandra. If you take like orders, for example, every time the order goes through its life cycle, we have a complete replica of the complete order that exists in the relational database in Cassandra, so that any read requests that come through or anything where we don't really need to be transactional with that particular entity, we can actually go and get the data out of Cassandra. We've also implemented the same pattern with Redis in some limited context where the amount of data from a transactional standpoint uh, you know, could pretty much fit in memory. Moving on, uh, another area where uh, we, we leveraged uh, Redis was with this whole uh, tracing and troubleshooting business. Again, uh, we were not in the best of health at some points last year, so uh, where this really helped us was we built this whole, you know, just like we built what we call the gatekeeper internally, we also built this transaction timer. And effectively what the transaction timer does is all these threads that are coming through, we had approximately 1,000 JVMs that make up the order management solution. And that's the total footprint that we have. And those 1,000 JVMs, how many of our threads are running in each one of those JVMs, each of the threads effectively have an identity in terms of it's trying to process a particular order for a particular transaction in a particular context. So we take all that information, and, and it's not very clear down below, but it's there in that screenshot when, when you get it later. Effectively, it says for this particular order from this particular machine, this user in this context started a transaction. And then we had a very low cost tracing ability to say, what are the transactions that started that did not finish in time? So the way we achieve that with Redis is we, we use the sorted set uh, data structure, and in the sorted set, the timestamp would effectively be like get system dot get current time in millis type thing. So at any point in time, we could go back and do a Z range scan that would tell us what the oldest transactions were that were still lingering. And that way, in a scenario where there are like 1,000 JVMs and so many requests coming through from so many places, it was much easier for us to troubleshoot the specific JVMs or the specific orders or specific order profiles, because sometimes it's the size of the order that, that, that harms us. So we, we were able to like pinpoint track that, and we were finding that really difficult to do you know, prior to 
implementing this. So, so it turned out to be really useful and something that we, we worked on quite closely with our ops team and implemented. Uh, that, that leveraged the sorted set and the, and, and the pub sub basically came to the aspect of one of the things we were doing from a dashboarding standpoint is, okay, so at any point in time we know that these are the orders, but let's say we want to set up saying we want a dump of every single transaction that took greater than 30 seconds. So it was possible now for us, you know, again, a very low cost fashion, again, this is, if you actually go and write this from scratch, literally it's one iteration worth of work. Approximately one, one to two weeks, I mean, depending on the length of your iteration. But uh, effectively, we were able to track for a given order in a given context exactly how long had that transaction been running for. And the moment it took more than 30 seconds, we would use PubSub and start writing it out to Splunk or something like that for a more permanent storage so that we could start running analysis. So it was very helpful in two contexts. I mean, one was sometimes, I mean, again, if you use the relational database like, like we do, you end up with, like, let's say, a blocking lock or, or you just end up with a transaction weight. And you want to find out which transaction caused the transaction weight. Obviously, you can go dig into a lot of the logs and try to figure out you know, what's in the logs. But we all know, I mean, if it's a production type scenario, it's very difficult to find that. You know, it's not. So this kind of like helped us really pretty quickly pinpoint to say, OK, out of all the transactions that are running, here are the five transactions that took more than 30 seconds, and it's coming from this particular client in this context, let's go and drill down and see what. Again, we have other APM tools. We're not trying to say that this is a replacement for the APM tools. We, we use AppDynamics pretty big. But I, I think this gave us a level of precise knowledge into what was exactly going wrong with Redis that we just could not have had otherwise. So so I think, I think that worked out quite well. Uh, I think that covers most of that. Uh, I think in terms of implementation, again, you can look it up, nothing very complicated there. Uh, effectively, it is, uh, we're using the sorted set, that's the key. And the sorted set is an incredibly powerful data structure. I, I think really, really uh, encourage you to go take a look at you know, where, where you can use that. But we were using the sorted set with pipelining, and I think that combination worked really well for us. So uh, what the threads do is very simple, again, in the context of the monolith, we were not doing anything risky. Right at the beginning of the transaction, we would go call out to Redis and say, hey, let me go record when the transaction is starting. And at the end of most of these transactions, we would again go call out to this process that said, let's go, let's go clean this record up. And so again, really, really straightforward, simple stuff, but had a good deal of benefit from it. Uh, the other part, I mean, I think overall is, uh, I'm, I'm, I mean, if any of you have gone to the website, you, you, you know, you'll see that we offer pretty much most of the omni-channel fulfillment methods that you expect. I mean, uh, all of it, pickups, deliveries, uh, special order, merchandise being brought into the store so you can save on shipping costs and so forth. So if you take something like the inventory computation engine, I mean, we, we have an extremely high volume inventory computation engine where uh, real time, uh, Approximately in 15 seconds, we track what the availability of each item is across all stores in the US, the 1,980 stores. We're now rolling it out for all the DCs, so we have it for about six DCs right now, but uh, that's going to expand even further. So the volume of transactions that we perform there are, um, overall, there are about 200 million records at any point in time, uh, you know, at an item location level. And then on a regular hour, we're, we're processing about 2 million transactions, but there are, there are some use cases, including search, uh, you know, search where you go to the list page and actually look at, hey, I only want to search, I mean, I'm searching for a hammer, but show me only those hammers that have inventory. And if I'm doing pickup, I only want those hammers that have inventory within a 10 mile radius. I mean, show me only those items, you know, don't want to waste my time looking at a bunch of other stuff that I can't pick up anyway. So for those type of situations, we've been doing a bunch of inventory computation transactions, and we actually use Redis as an ephemeral instance. It's purely for its data structure capabilities. If you take something like, say, finding the intersection, you know, there's, you're looking for 10 items in your cart, and you're looking for what is the precise location where all the 10 items are available. So 
what this really helps you do is you go use like a Redis data structure, like say sorted set, for example, and you can load up the data structure with the set of data that you're looking for and use existing data structure logic like intersect, for example, to go figure out exactly what the right set of stores are. So that's incredibly powerful because it saved us writing a whole bunch of code that we had to maintain. And you know, we were just using standard Redis libraries and effectively using it in that mode you know, has saved us tremendous amount of performance benefits, but also just purely in terms of maintenance, I think it just makes a ton of sense. So that, that, was, that was really helpful. In also trying to do that, uh, the whole uh, Geo Redis is something that we really use because uh, any point in time, the set of stores that we need to consider needs to vary based on whatever is a specific zip code for which we're searching. So we you know, try to go after the, that set of stores using GeoRedis. So for example, if you take the 2,000 stores and the DCs, we load it all in memory and we say, hey, in the context of the current request for this particular zip code, what are the stores that are in a, say, a 25 mile radius? Get that list of stores, get that inventory picture, and then load up from the inventory picture, which actually comes from Cassandra for the most part for us, and then load it into the ephemeral Redis instance and say, hey, I want to go perform a, a intersect operation so that we can actually look at what's, what's there. Some of the other uh, algorithms that, that we use, I mean, list sets, hashes all over the place. Uh, Hyperloglog -log was one of the really interesting data structures. Uh, again, for the leaderboard type scenarios, uh, we, we found that quite useful in terms of uh, hey, which item is trending, what item categories are trending, what customers are trending, et cetera. And so if we had to go back and show those type of quick summaries, the hyperlog was useful. The other, the, the third bullet there, the multi-attribute uniqueness search. So that was an interesting use case, one that really kind of shows how Redis shines where the relational database struggles. So. At the time when you're creating an order, if let's say there's a customer record and the customer record has uh, say 35 or 40 different attributes, you need to do a uniqueness check on about, about 30 attributes that then tells you whether this particular address was previously recorded in the system or not, so that we don't keep repeating the same record over and over, especially in the case of a guest customer. I mean, if you're registered and you identify yourself, that's great, but, but if you're a guest customer, we don't want to go create the same records over and over, because that can grow very quickly. So for the 200 million records, when you actually try to go and look up on the 25 attributes approximately, we found that CPU was really, really shooting. I mean, that one transaction used to be close to like 10% of CPU on the database approximately. And so what we did was, I mean, with Redis, we found that we could have done brute force and we did that in one of the iterations. So we just took some of those key data with the 200 million records and tried to, you know, like put it in Redis. But we found that, you know, at that point it, we needed a cluster and so finally that didn't really go well. So what went well was we used uh, like a hashing algorithm, like say Murmur3 hash, and we effectively did the hashing on those attributes that mattered and loaded the hash into Redis. And that really was, was, was awesome because the next time you know, an order was coming through, we could then quickly compute the hash, go against Redis, compare, and, and that definitely reduced the database CPU and got us to a better place. Pretty much, I, I think that gives you a quick summary of some of those patterns for which we've been using. We're certainly looking to set up a cluster, looking at you know, how we provision Redis on-prem, off-prem. Uh, we, we use CloudBolt on-prem. Uh, but you know, looking at things like Terraform, trying to make it uh, seamless across our on-prem and our cloud instances. And I think continue to carve out more scenarios. I mean, it's sort of like the balance, like I was mentioning, is about 10,000 operations a second right now on Redis, which is not great from Redis standards, but in the context of the overall transaction that we were trying to meet was really useful. But try to offload more scenarios. I mean, that's, that's effectively what we're doing. I think it's, we got about 10 minutes left, but I feel like that, that's pretty much all that I had. And yeah, if you have any questions, we can talk about it else. I think we got 10 minutes back. Sure, please. Yeah. 
No, we, we, okay, so just to repeat the question, if I understood it right, I think the question was, do we continue to see the need to use Redis and Cassandra, or are we gonna to converge towards one? And at least from our standpoint, the answer is emphatically, we will, we plan to continue not only with Redis and Cassandra, but also with Elasticsearch, also with Kafka for, you know, from a messaging standpoint, we're also bringing in Graphite from a time series standpoint. Some of that could change. Like for example, if you're able to say deprecate usage of Graphite and we saw some time series uh, information in Redis, if you're able to go that direction, great. But we do not have any overwhelming uh, intention to standardize towards one database. We really want to make it best of breed. So. Any other questions? Thank you, if not, thank you.